Hello everyone, I'm Danny Campbell, senior pastor here at the Tabernacle. Our service will begin in just a moment, but I want to take a moment to personally thank you for tuning in. Your time and attention are very much appreciated. I also want to personally invite you to come and visit us for our in-person 1015 worship service, the one that's about to begin, as well as our other on-campus services and activities throughout the week. We believe that nothing can take the place of in-person corporate worship and the gathering of believers. So if you're a member of the Tabernacle watching online, we welcome you back. And for those watching who are not members of any church, we encourage you to follow the Lord's leading in finding a church family, hopefully here at the Tabernacle. In the absence of being able to come physically, we're so delighted that you've joined us online and so thankful for the technology that allows us to provide this service. You can find more information about service and activity times, information about how to become a member, as well as a host of other things by checking out the website at www.thetabernaclefamily.org. Our service is about to begin, so I encourage you to use this remaining time to remove anything that may distract you, pick up your Bible, and pray that the Lord would speak to you during this service. Thank you, and God bless. That was a beautiful song, wasn't it? That was awesome. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. Good morning, guys. Did you get any sleep? A little bit? Just wait till you get older, right? And you you can't plan ahead for, for that as well. Well, Danny and I, well, Danny, Elizabeth, Lynn and I go way back. And um, it first started with Danny and I. And um, when I remember when I first met Danny, he was an unusual person. <laughs> and um, you described yourself to me later on that, that he was an angry young man. He is no longer young. <laughs> and... But, needless to say, you have the real deal. You know that. Amen. With Danny and Elizabeth. And uh, hold on to them, love them, and do all that you can because God has and will continue to use them in amazing ways. Thank you, Danny. I am not here to sell anything. Um, Danny did want me to talk a little bit about the Colson Center and so on, which I, which I will do. And, uh, but for the most part, I want to talk about our culture now and how we as followers of Jesus Christ are intended to be people who stand in the gap and who represent Jesus Christ to a culture that is increasingly, increasingly losing its desire for anything meaningful. So, we're going to see if we work here with the PowerPoint. Ta-da! Okay. That's just, uh, the Colson Center is in Colorado Springs. Our focus is, of course, to understand the culture so that we can train others to do the same. You may have heard Breakpoint on the radio, all of the uh, information that has come out, uh, whether it be on YouTube, whether it be on um, uh, the the various downloads that you can find on the webinars and so on. And uh, God is blessing. In fact, as um, Danny said, we started with 100. Uh, Chuck Colson had this program called the Centurions. That may ring a bell with a lot of you. And... um, the idea was that you read a book that Chuck Colson said, let's read this book this month, and then he'd get on the phone, and uh, about 100 people were doing this, and they would talk about the book, and he'd get the best books. And uh, when Chuck passed away back in 2012, that program ended, and John Stone Street, who is the uh, CEO now of the Colson Center, um, also a student at Bryan College, and uh, one of my students, asked if I would come and help with the Colson uh, Fellows Program. I told him no, but you know how that goes. And I've been there almost seven years now, and uh, we have 1,300 in the program. And it's, uh, they're all professional men and women from around the world who want to understand today's culture and do something about it. They're tired of being told, they're tired of being scared, they're tired of just feeling out. They want to know our Lord, They want to know his word, and they want to know his world. This is the world that he said, for God so loved the world. And so that's that's what we do. But what I want to talk about this morning is making sense of the world. 
the, the world of worldviews. When it comes to culture, we as Christians, we usually have one of three approaches. The first approach is to be offended by the culture, right? So that we flee from it, we withdraw from it. The second is to be enamored by the culture. This is really cool. So that we assimilate. And you've seen a lot of churches, a lot of Christians that have done just that, right? You have. I looked for the world and I found it in the church. I looked for the church and I found it in the world. I think God has a responsibility for us to create a culture, to create a world that is desirable to those outside the faith. The third approach, I think, is the one that Jesus commanded us, and that's to have a broken heart toward culture, to be distressed, to have compassion so that we might engage it with the heart and the mind of Jesus Christ. That's why you come here, I hope, to be equipped to do just that. You know, every day over 100,000 people come to Christ. Over 20,000 of them are Muslim every single day. You know what the fastest growing Christian community is in what country? Iran, right, Iran of all places. God is doing some amazing things and he didn't even ask our permission or what we thought about it. God is at work. And he's doing some marvelous things in so many ways. And I know a lot, a lot of young people, you know, you're struggling a bit. 90% of young people say that life has no meaning. Now, most of you, many of you probably don't believe that, but some of you are struggling with that. Some of you are struggling with social media. Some of you are struggling with online pornography. Some of you are struggling with things that you're not quite sure you can talk about with anybody that really matters. And you have no idea what's going to happen over the next few years, but you're hanging on. You got so many secrets, it's so difficult oftentimes to look anybody square in the eye. But the answer, of course, is always found in what God is doing. And maybe you're an angry young man or an angry young woman. And I would say you could grow up to be Danny, but I'm not sure that's the right way to say it. You could grow up and be yourself and all that God has for you. Don't, don't, don't miss that. Don't miss that. When we talk about worldviews, you know, it, it's, it's not so much that that's a, a fancy word for talking about the philosophy of life, and something, which, it, which it is. But this cultural moment, how do we live in it as Christians, whether you are 91 or whether you're here today and you're 15 or 14, or maybe you're eight or nine, it doesn't matter. The Lord told us to go into all the world and make disciples, right? God bless you. And that means that what we have to do is recognize that if you go all over the world, you've got people of different cultures, different languages, different backgrounds, different histories, right? So how do you connect with those kind of people? That means we have to make some adjustments. We can't just keep doing things the way we're doing them. We need to, in one way or another, learn how to cross those lines and barriers. What I want to share with you is to, this morning is to point out that there are 8 billion worldviews in the world because there are 8 billion people in the world. But they all fall into one of three major categories. And just being able to do that and to recognize that is a leg up. Years ago, when I was at Dallas Seminary uh, studying for my doctorate, I, uh, we, Lynn and I became kind of youth pastors of a church. We had three youth in the church. And they asked me to be the youth pastor. I said, I can't mess this up. And in two months, we'd grown to two. And um, <laughs> so I thought I had another month, and there'd be one. But... Um, what, what, I, what happened over the next, oh gosh, over the next few months, we had about 60 come to Christ, which was awesome. But one of the things I noticed is that so many of them were being, being influenced by their entertainment choices, particularly music. I mean, music has a lot of philosophy of life in it. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. 
So what I decided to do is, let's do this. It was, it was summer, so I said, what we're going to do, we have a meal every Wednesday night. I want you to bring in your favorite music. The favorite song from your most influential group. And we'll put the words up on the screen and we'll talk about it. We'll listen to it and we'll talk about it. And you can imagine, everybody tried to be too cool with their song. And realizing, I forgot those words are in it. Oh, cow, you know. It's all right. And we went through it. We ask questions like, what is the message here? What's the world view here? What's the singer trying to tell us to do? What does the singer say the good life is? What's he trying to tell us to believe? What's he trying to tell us that we're supposed to be doing? It was amazing. The conversations were fast, furious, long. It was awesome. Changed the lives of a lot of those kids, realizing that you can't take God out of everything. In fact, you can't take God out of anything because he's there. Amen. Uh, a number of years after that, I was, I was back in Dallas for a few things, and this young lady came up to me. I didn't recognize her at first, but she had been part of that youth group. And she reached out, and uh, she shook my hand. She was married and had two kids. And she shook my hand. She said, Bill Brown, you ruined my music listening. <laughs> I can't listen to a song now without thinking, okay, what's the song telling me to do? What's it telling me? What's it say the good life is? You know, and all these things. She had a mind that was active, which is what the Apostle Peter tells us. Prepare your minds for what? Action. And those young people learned to do that, and it was amazing. She said, I ruined her music listening, but she went on to say, it's the best gift I ever received, discernment. Discernment. Isn't that what the church should be doing? Shouldn't we be doing that, particularly with our young people? Not just wagging our finger in their face and say, stay away from that, don't do that. That doesn't last very long. So, sometimes when we talk worldviews, we're going to see that they fall into three major categories. And, and for, for many, you know, we see them side to side. This is the Indonesian soccer team, football team. They just scored a goal. And three of the players, one is a Christian, one is a Muslim, and one is a Buddhist. Can you tell which is which? Yeah. Buddhist, Christian, Muslim, left to right. All giving thanks for the goal. It's not always not quite always that obvious. Some churches are really doing some interesting things. When we were in Ohio, um, we were a big church. How many, 2,000? Was it like that? I can't remember. We, we started recruiting smaller people so we could get more people into the, the church. But um, what we did was, and I, I was just the participant, but um, we had four chairs on stage, and we had in this chair, a Buddhist monk in his saffron robe, a real Buddhist monk. Next to him was a Muslim imam. Next to him was a Jewish rabbi. And next to him was a Christian. I, I got to play the Christian. I was a Christian. I got to be there. Okay. <laughs> and the pastor just asked questions. You know, what's salvation? What, who was God? What about Jesus and scriptures and so on? All these kind of big questions. And one by one, they gave their answer. And you can imagine, this was a Baptist church now. This is the worship service for that day. Could you get away with that, Danny? I don't know. No, probably not. Okay. But you can imagine, it was mesmerizing. Instead of me standing up here saying, this is what Buddhists believe. There's a guy in an orange robe telling you what he believes. And people came out of the woodwork, not just Christians. Non-Christians came to hear this. And one by one, they answered those questions. Very last question before we ended the program was, what happens when you die? The Buddha said, whatever you want to have happen will happen. We don't know if there's life after death. We don't know if there's necessarily you're going to be born again in the sense of like the uh, reincarnation. But whatever you want. The Muslim said, well, if you've fulfilled the requirements of the five pillars and, and the scales, you've got more good works than bad works, Allah might let you go to heaven. Maybe. Possibly. And the Jewish rabbi says, we have no idea. There's not much about the, the afterlife in the Old Testament. 
And, and may, maybe there's a heaven, maybe there's a, we just don't know. All we know is what, what God is doing now in the world. And I'm sitting there going, this is awesome. Because if there's anything that Jesus Christ wanted us to know, it's what happens when you die. What the future holds. He told him in the upper room, I'm leaving, but I'm coming back. I'm preparing a place. I'm coming back. And again and again and again. When he rose from the dead, he's standing there in a new glorified human body. He said, this is what all of you will get. That's why he spent 40 days with them. So they would have no doubt what the future held. How about if, if that happened for you, somebody that you love dearly came and spent, this passed away, came and spent 40 days with you. Would you ever doubt what happens when you die? No. Oh. And that's why in the book of Acts, often when the, when the apostles were preaching, they called it, they were preaching the resurrection. That's for us. So I was describing that, and these guys were looking at me like, what? But that's what God has for us. And that church was like, wow. And did that motivate them? Yes. Did that change a lot of lives? Absolutely. Did a lot of people get angry about it? Of course. But I'm not saying every church should do that. You're off the hook. But, but in today's culture, we can't hide. Today's culture, we can't hide from anti-Christian, non-Christian worldviews. So let's start at the beginning. When we talk about worldviews. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You've probably heard that before. First verse of the Bible. Now, we say, oh, that's nice. That's nice. But this is one of the most important statements in philosophical history. In fact, C.S. Lewis says this. He says, no philosophical theory which I have yet come across is a radical improvement on the words of Genesis that in the beginning God made heaven and earth. Because once you say that, you set the course for understanding everything in the world as coming from God. Everything belongs to him. And that's the whole point of Genesis 1-1 being stated that way. C.S. Lewis being an atheist and becoming a Christian, great story. The reluctant convert, he calls himself. The reluctant convert. Just importantly are the, are the verses that occur near the end so God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. These two verses and the verses in between really set the agenda for understanding the Christian worldview. And sometimes we have to go back there again and again and again, particularly in this era when people are struggling so much for identity, personal identity, who am I, what am I? And you're striking everywhere except here to find out where, where this, what's your sexuality, what is your, what is your uh, perspective on life in the world, what, what is your culture. Now, all these things, people are trying to find an identity away from God. And once you do that, life goes off the rails. A worldview is a story. That's what I'd like for you to remember. When we say worldview, just think a story. Story. What is the story of the world, okay? Story of the world. And we'll come back to this, but the Christian worldview has, of course, four chapters. Creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. In fact, if you have your Bibles, okay, you know, the Bible opens, we just saw that verse, and the, the latter verses after that, after God created man, humanity was in face-to-face, -face, intimate relationship with God, right? You, you can say right, right? Okay, yeah, he, in the beginning. Two chapters later is the rebellion, the fall, where humanity turned its back on God. And we have been living that out ever since. And we see in the Old Testament how that is worked out in murders and rapes and death and destruction. Over and over again we see that because God has said, because of this, God has set us aside for destruction. That's the idea of the word curse. That's what the word curse means. This is no longer the land of the living that God created. This is the land of the dying. 
Things rot and rust and decay and die. It's not the way it's supposed to be. It's not the way God intended it to be. And one day it won't be that way. But until then, until then, we are living under this sense of curse and destruction. In fact, if you go to the last chapter of the Old Testament, which is what, Danny? Malachi 4. Malachi 4. All right. You've got the Jewish Bible, I understand there. Okay, good. Yeah. If you go to the last word of the last verse of the last chapter of the last book of the Old Testament, what is the word? Curse. It's supposed to be curse. Some of your translations may not have it, but in, in Hebrew it is haram, curse. In fact, the, the uh, Masoretes, when they were copying the text, they did not want the prophetic word to end with the word curse. So they went back up in an earlier chapter from Malachi and repeated it after this. If you have a Hebrew, your Hebrew Bible with you, you can look and see. They put verses after that because they didn't want it to end with the word curse. They weren't adding to the scripture. They were just repeating it. Rerun, boom, right there. But here, the curse is still here. That's the second chapter, the fall. But then the third chapter is simply what? Redemption. God begins to move. Aslan is on the move. The winter is beginning to melt and thaw. And we see the outworking of God's love through the person of Jesus Christ. He died. He rose again. So what? Ah, now we know. It's for us. It's for the world, for the sins of the world. And so we see redemption played out. And then if you go to the very last chapter of the very last book of the New Testament. That's right, Revelation. Somebody knew I'd ask that. Book of Revelation. No, it's Book of Concordance, actually. Here. Here. All right, go to chapter 22 of the book. My goodness, I forgot all that was in here. Just look for the red letters in Revelation. Okay, last chapter in the book of Revelation 22. This is such a beautiful picture of what the world is. God is restoring what began. Verse 1, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal flowing down from the throne of God to the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of nations. No longer will there be any curse. It's gone. That's the story of the Christian worldview. And whatever God has for us in the, in the future, we have no idea, but we know it's going to be awesome. Eye has not seen nor ear heard. That is what the Christian worldview is. And that's what we not only hope for, but we know is going to happen. But worldviews are not just seen in, in, in bold explanations like this, but it's also seen in just about every song, every movie, every television show, every book, every commercial that you've ever seen and read. It's full of worldviews. You just haven't noticed, haven't thought about it. Triply, if you like, if, if you like some, some really good music, Triply and Lecrae sometimes do a lot of things together. It's awesome. But he was talking about it in his book called The Good Life. He was listening to, uh, and, and he'd been mentored by some of the individuals who were in rap music at the time. And he was listening to a song um, by Jay-Z and Jiggy. And he said, yes, I had the clean version. So my ears were shielded from the foul language, but not from all harm. There is no edited version that removes worldviews. They were lecturing me about what my aspirations should be and what is most important in the world. I was a star pupil. I ate it up. If I wanted the good life, I needed the money, the cars, and the girls. That's what's discipling a lot of our kids today. not just in commercials, but in, in history, in reality. This is, this is a city of Phnom Penh in Cambodia. Lynn and I were there. I was speaking there and then up in Thailand. And 
looking out over the city, in fact, we were up on the, on the roof of a house of a, of a guy who, who uh, was leading a hospital there. And um, the Mercy Medical Center is there. It's one of the fabulous, fabulous ministry, fabulous uh, health care clinic and hospital and so on for the people there. And it's free. They share Christ. They do incredible, probably the best hospital in the whole country of Cambodia. Across the street is one of the largest Wats, one of the largest Buddhist temples in Cambodia. And out toward the city uh, center, from the city center, in fact, all over Cambodia, are the killing fields, where one quarter of the population was murdered by the communist Khmer Rouge in the late 70s. 25% of the population, because they didn't fit in, they were wealthy. They were Christians. They didn't agree with their philosophy. So they were murdered and buried in mass graves. That country still struggles, reeling from that, if you can imagine. But what I want you to see is notice three different ways of looking at life. The Christ-centered perspective of Mercy Medical Center. The, the Buddhist Wa, where people go to meditate, to be further down the line toward enlightenment. Or the atheistic Khmer Rouge, where not everybody matters. Those are the three worldviews. Theism, the belief in God. Transcendentalism, the belief that everything is God. And naturalism, the belief that there is no God at all. A lot of people like to look at the world through the lens of, of worldviews. And I had been lecturing in, in Kiev. I've been to Kiev many times. So I have a lot of good friends there. In fact, uh, there's a fellow there that I've been mentoring for, gosh, for almost 15 years. Uh, he's, Cam, uh, he's Cambodian. He's a uh, Ukrainian. And he calls me every morning from Kiev and we pray together. We've been doing this for four and a half years. And he's an addict as well, but struggling. And uh, God has really given him... Great, great, great success in so many ways. Um, but one of the places I met him was in, in Kiev when I was lecturing there for a lot of uh, uh, public school teachers. And I was talking about worldviews. Just like I'm going to share with you the three major worldviews, I did this. And there was a group of 13 teachers from one school that had come to Kiev, and they were staying at a nearby hotel. And after the first lecture, they went back and talked last night. That who does that guy think he is? What is it? Three worldviews. You, you, you're kidding us. And they were angry and so on. And uh, they were angry young women and men. Okay. And um, second night, same thing. After we, I, I did Q&A for an hour afterwards, you know, and then they were just, but by the, the final day, the last day of the week, they came to me, those 13 women and men came and surrounded me and, and gave me a coin that's commemorated when Ukraine was free from the Russian regime, which gives the, the war now a special meaning for me, as you can imagine. And they said, we want you to have this coin because last night we all changed our worldview. Which is the only way, the only vocabulary they had to talk about them coming to Christ. We changed our worldview, which is really what happens when you become a Christian. Right? You change, you change your worldview. So how many worldviews are there? Well, there's eight billion, but they fall into three major, major categories. And let me share three basic truths about that, okay? First truth is that everybody has a worldview, whether you like it or not, by decision or default, you have a worldview. It's part of being a human. Your cats, your dogs, your horses, your cows do not have worldviews. But we do. Because we are made in the image and likeness of God. God has given you a moral nature written on your heart of what's right and what's wrong. God has given you the ability to transcend yourself. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, we read that God put what in our hearts? Eternity in our hearts. That's why we look at the James Webb and see as far out as we can. Everybody has a worldview. Actually, a worldview has you. You can't escape it. I had a, one girl in uh, our youth group, I talked about worldviews. She came up and said, worldviews, I got to get me one of them. <laughs> I 
And I said, you got one. I can just ask you a couple questions. I'll tell you exactly what it is. So what's a um, good explanation, description of a worldview? It's simply this, three key words. It's an explanation. It's an interpretation. It's how you explain the world. And then you use that to interpret the world. And then you apply it, to, you live it out. It's not just a head thing, it's, how you, it's a whole life view as well. After 9-11, I, saw, I read several books about why 9-11 occurred. And they were from different views. I read a Muslim view. I read an atheist view. I read a Christian view. And, several, and you can imagine, they were looking at the same event, but seeing it so different. They interpreted it differently because they had different worldviews. They saw the world differently. Explanation, interpretation. You use it to interpret and then finally application. You, you live it. You live it out. In fact, every person's worldview is the foundation of their life. Your values arise from your, your particular worldview. If you're a Christian, then your values should reflect that, right? If you're an atheist, it will... You know, they in the same way will reflect that. But what if you say you're a Christian, but your values are an atheist? What that means is your worldview is really an atheistic worldview. You may not live what you profess, but you will live what you believe. It's inescapable. Inescapable. Basic truth number two. Your worldview is how you answer ultimate questions. I think there's four ultimate, there's really 12, but there's a four basic ultimate questions of life. Of origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. Origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. Origin, where did everything come from? If you remember, I was telling you about our church back in Ohio. He used some of these questions. Where did everything come from? Oh, God created it, or it just happened, or Brahma's always been here, you know. And how you answer that question really determines how you answer the next three, right? They do. Meaning, why are we here? Most people have this sense that you've got a reason to exist. In fact, USA Today did a survey of its readership, and the question was, if you could ask God any question, what would you ask him? Which I thought was a strange question for USA Today to ask. But the number one question far and away was, why am I here? Why am I here? The Princess Trust did a survey in 2009, over 10 years ago, 14 years ago, of young people from age 15 to 24. And what they found was that 10% of those young people said life is not worth living. There is no purpose. They did it again 10 years later, just a couple of years ago. Same questions. 90% of young people, 90% of young people said life has no meaning. My life has no purpose. If you believe that, you're going to live differently, aren't you? And yet that is the culture in which we find ourselves. How should we live? Morality. Who decides what's right and wrong? Is it God or is it us together? We just do it on our own. Interestingly, in the transcendental worldview, there is no God. We'll talk about that in just a second. So how do you decide what's right or wrong? Well, you do because you're God. You're part of God, right? You decide. And then finally, destiny. What happens when I die? Or where's everything headed? Where's the universe headed? What happens when I die? <coughs> And if we take these ultimate questions, by the way, I'll leave the PowerPoint with you if you want to give it to anybody. Um, if we say, here are the ultimate questions, they fall into these, those three main categories that I've already talked about of theism, naturalism, and transcendentalism. Remember, a worldview is a story. So they each have three different stories about, about the universe. So let me describe them quickly, okay? 
First, story one. There is no God, only the universe. This is the worldview called naturalism. And the story is simply this, that there was a big bang, things brought into existence somehow, some way, and everything is expanding now. Since 1960, and, the Hub and Hubble found out that things are expanding, the universe is expanding and accelerating. And then it's going to expand so much that it's just going to get cold and freeze and nothing can live. That's the story. You say, what, what, what about us? Nobody understands us. We're, life, human life is an anomaly. It's an accident. It doesn't matter. We're all headed, every part of the universe is headed for a cold, icy death. And so nothing matters. There is no purpose there is no meaning. Everything that exists has a physical cause. There's nothing spiritual. One of the most well-known atheist writers today is Yuval Noah Harari. And he puts it this way. The neurons in our brain fire, which leads us to our various decisions. The best bet as a human is to realize that you are just a collection of molecules, are you, all you are, and everything you think and do is only meaningful because you and other humans have ascribed a meaning to it. Otherwise, it is meaningless. It doesn't matter what you do. Who cares? You shouldn't, according to this worldview. Well, for you Fight Club fans, Tuck Palahniuk has Tyler Durden saying this about us. He says, you are not special. You are not a beautiful or unique snowflake. You are the same decaying organic matter as everything else. We are all part of the same compost heap. That's a gospel that we'll preach. Uh, before we jump into this, I, I was uh, speaking just outside of Moscow in a place called Tver, and um, the university there. And um, I, I just described the three main worldviews. It took me about an hour because we had to interpret it in Russian. And um, the question and answer lasted for over an hour and a half. It was amazing. These were all faculty members. It was great. And uh, afterwards, this, this large man walked up to the front. And uh, I, I joked because he was big. I'm 6'2", and I was looking up at him like this. He had long black hair, long black beard, all black clothes. And he came up with an interpreter. And uh, I, I was looking at him, he came up, and all I could think of was, Rasputin lives. You know, here he is. <laughs> but he was a professor of astrophysics at the University of Tver, which is what I was studying to be down at the University of South Florida. And so immediately we were best buddies. No, we weren't. But um, he looked down at me, and he said, Dr. Brown, according to you, I am a naturalist. I said, okay. And he looked away and did this on his beard, thinking very astrophysical thoughts, I guess. And then he looked down at me again and said, I'm not sure I want to be a naturalist. <laughs> and then he did it again. And then he walked away. And I thought, you know, that was a good thing. Because worldviews have the way when you describe them, people automatically think, that's my... That's my worldview. I didn't know I had a worldview. And yet, is that what I really want? I've seen that over and over and over again. Where just by talking about worldviews, people say, awesome, awesome. All right, story two. God is the universe and the universe is God. Everything in one way or another is divine. Reality is spirit. The physical in which we find ourselves is, it's maya, it's illusion. It's illusion. And here's the threefold story of transcendentalism. You have Brahma, I'm using the Hindu terms here. Because you use Hindu, Buddhism, you use Taoism, some Confucianism, if you like it. But these are all mainly the Eastern religions. You'll recognize that. Or George Lucas. All of these fit right, right in there. Yeah. <laughs> Brahma, where everything is one, everything is spiritual. And then it divides up, you know, the yin and the yang. Everything becomes binary. Physical, spiritual. Odd, even, male, female, night, dark, and so on. That's, what, that's where we are now. 
And then soon everything's going to go back. You're going to lose your body. Right now you have all these lifestyles, right? You have all these lifetimes. You come back again and again. And karma is your guide. Karma is the good things that you do. It's the bad things that you do. And if you get better karma on, the, on this particular lifestyle, you may go up the scale of humanity or living things, or you may go back. The goal is to get out so that you get out of this cycle of birth and rebirth so you can go back into nirvana and become one with everything again. That is the hope and the dream. That is the hope and the dream. And of course, it's not just three chapters because this happens over and over and over and over and over. It's been going on for infinity and will continue to go on for infinity. It has, every, you know, reaches into everything from Buddhism to Taoism to Confucianism, uh, Scientology, um, the Kabbalah movement, and so on. And as I mentioned, Ultimately, the force is the larger mystery of the universe, and to trust your feelings is your use to, um, is your way to that. You never heard Obi Wan Kenobi say, "Luke, the force loves you." Pray to the force, Luke. No, he said, "Reach out with your feelings." Right? Yeah. We want to combine these. Uh, I just I just stuck this in last night because I thought it was interesting. Here is a lady on the left. She is a Unitarian Universalist pastor. She is very, very transcendental. She calls herself a Christian, but she doesn't believe there's actually a God or there's a force and so on. And on the, on the right, of course, is Christopher Hitchens, a well-known atheist who, who died, gosh, almost four years now. Uh, a brilliant uh, fellow. In, in a lot of ways. And so she's interviewing him for the Portland Magazine, and she, so she says to him, you know, you talk about Christianity in this particular way. Well, I'm a Christian, but I don't believe in this fact that, that Jesus lived, or that he died for my sins, this is the atonement and all of that. Um, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't agree with that, right? And listen to this. This is the atheist speaking. He says this, only in this respect, I would say that if you don't believe that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ, in other words, the Messiah, and that he rose again from the dead and by his sacrifice our sins are forgiven, you're really not, in any meaningful sense, a Christian. So here's an atheist preaching the gospel <laughs> to a transcendentalist, okay? The whole, the whole interview is fascinating, by the way. All right, let's look at story three, and this is uh, the story of where God created the universe. This is broadly called theism or monotheism, the belief that there is a God who brought everything into existence. And there are three major theistic religions, monotheistic religions in the world, and what are they? Oh, there you go, good. Judaism, this is chronological, Christianity and Islam, all believing there was a God who created everything. But just because there are those who believe that there is a God doesn't mean necessarily that they're all teaching the same thing. And they're not. Because that's exactly what Jesus taught. In fact, the, the, the watershed, of course, is the person of Jesus Christ. That's why we call ourselves, we call ourselves Christians. We call ourselves followers of Christ. In fact, I can, I, I'm always careful about the way I use the word Christian just because it's a, it's a great noun but not a good adjective, if you know what I mean. You know, like a Christian school. Christ, schools can't be Christians, only people can I like saying Christ-centered schools, which is better. But if you're in a Christian school, you don't have to change it. But the, you get the idea. We are Christ-centered. The person of Jesus is who we're following. The, the person of Jesus is who we are following. Um, Lynn and I went up to Toledo, Ohio, to the medical school up there. And uh, they were having a meeting of the, a gathering of the uh, Christian Medical Students Association and the Islamic Medical Students Association. They all came together. And uh, the idea was that I was going to speak to them for 30 minutes about what is Christianity. And then an Islamic scholar from the university is going to be talking about what is Islam for 30 minutes. And then we do Q&A. And so I called some friends who were missionaries. I said, I've, I've been studying Islam and everything, but I've only got 30 minutes. What should I focus on? And he said, focus on this. Focus on number one of what grace is. Christianity is the only faith that has anything to do with grace. Grace is what you get you don't deserve. You deserve punishment 
But God gives you forgiveness, love, eternal life in his presence. All the others, you have to earn it. Every other religion is karmic except for Christianity. Talk about that. And then he said another thing is that, well, Jesus revealed God as Father. You look in the Old Testament, you don't see the word Father mentioned but maybe a dozen times. And usually it's the Father of Israel. God's the Father of Israel. But in the New Testament, 250 times God is called Father. 170 of those are by Jesus. Teach us to pray, Father who art in heaven, right? And so that's what I did. I talked about that to the, these students. And you got all the Muslim students over here, about 50, about 50 of each. And the Christian students over here, medical students. And so I talked about that. And then the <laughs> Islamic scholar got up. And we were sitting at the front of the, the table, you know. He st- stood up. He was a big guy, too. And, and, and he looked down at me a couple times. And he said, in Islam, we cannot call God Father. Because that brings a lot down to the human level. And then he looked down at me and said, and that is blasphemy. Huh. And I said, it brings God down to the human level. I said, that's the whole point. That's what Jesus did. God becoming a man. Because God can't die. And the only way to absolve our sin is through death. Our death or his. I remember when I came to Christ, I was overwhelmed by that love. And I haven't got over it yet. I haven't got over it yet. So, Christian story. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. Notice the little star there. That's like at the mall, you are here. Kind of thing. Just give me a few more minutes to answer the question, so what? Okay, nice, Bill, thank you. You got three worldviews. I took some notes. Well, he started to take notes. But here are some important things. Number one, the Christian worldview teaches that every person is made in God's image. Every person. Amen. It's a key feature of the Christian worldview. It's laughed at. Harari says... It talks about you, the United States saying somehow they believe what Jesus taught, that everybody is equal in the sight of God, and he's making fun of it. That's our life. That's what we believe. What is the image of God? It's not what we do, it's who we are. It's what we are. We are created by him and for him which means a number of things. It means every person is made in God's image, every person belongs to God, and every person has God-given value. They belong to him, not to us, not to the government, but to our Lord. This is the focus, a focus of our current cultural moment. But we know what this means for you and for me. It means that every person that we meet, every person that we talk to is in the image of God whether you like them or not, whether you agree with them or not, whether they hate you or not, they are made in God's image and you should, must respect that. Every life is precious. Every life is precious. And not only is it precious, we all have the same level of preciousness. And that's why Christians have been saving babies from the very beginning. Those Romans would throw out their baby girls because they didn't want baby girls and Christians would go and pick them up and bring them into their families. Christians are still doing things just like that. Not long after Dr. King was here in Danville, he went someplace and said these words, I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Going back to the creation theme that's the bedrock of Christianity. Because the Christian worldview, it's not political, it's not social. 
And just quickly, I'll let that close up here. History is filled with the tragic rejection of God's truth. Whether it be Adolf Hitler, where he had Jews, Christians, the handicap, anybody with a dark skin, murdered. Those of Aryan descent were seen at the highest level, remember, right? Everyone else needed to be eliminated. If there was going to be, you know, a future hope. Same thing has happened in the socialist countries, whether it be Russia, China, North Korea, Cambodia. The 20th century was noted for 100 million people be, being killed by socialist regimes, being murdered because they didn't fit in. They didn't rise to the top. And we see in our own culture today the flashpoints of the image of God, truth, that's part of the Christian worldview. Personal identity, personal equality and value, personal life issues like abortion, euthanasia, and so on. How do we respond? How are we supposed to respond at this cultural moment? If you're not praying for all of these issues, you're missing the point of what it means to know God. Danny mentioned the Colson Fellows Program, and there are so many of them. Did you know the Colson Fellows Program began actually in the state of Virginia? It's pretty cool. 1,300 people around the country are in this program, and it's, it's a 10-month program where we study all of these issues so that we know how to talk about them. It's one thing to talk about woke, but it's another thing to understand what it is and why people believe it and how we can respond in ways that honor Jesus Christ and honor them. Third, your worldview is seen in how you live your life. I said earlier, you may not live what you profess, but you will live what you believe. Your heart is the biggest guide of what you really believe. What the heart loves, the will chooses, and the mind justifies. So we are followers of Christ. Let me close with these words. I memorized this chapter because it bothered me so much. Because when we're following Jesus Christ, we need to follow Jesus Christ. Not bits and pieces. Listen to this. You can imagine how this went over in the first century. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Can you imagine what they were thinking? To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, don't demand them back. Overwhelming. So how do we live this out now? Danny will talk about that in his next message. But there are ways of doing that. Do we want to live like everybody else and just go to church on Sunday? Do we really want to live a life that's compelling? And that God blesses. Later on, a few verses later, Jesus says this. He reiterates, love your enemies. The word is agape. Love your enemies. Do good. Lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And you will be children of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Did you hear that? God is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. If he is, so should we. People who we disagree, people that we would turn our noses up, people that we think, well, we should love them, be kind to them. Every person is made in God's image. What's the great command, the greatest command? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and, and your neighbor as yourself. Notice how that's all one sentence. God, love him with your whole being and then love your neighbor as yourself, which you love a lot. Love your neighbor as yourself. So in other words, you can't separate. I love God. I just hate people. Because they're all made in God's image. And to see people as God sees them through his eyes, through that worldview, it's striking how you see differently.
And you look for ways to make connections and to love. In fact, one writer, one of my favorite writers said this. She said, think of the person that you love the least in this world. Think of the person that you love the least in this world. That's how much you love God. Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? You know, I think the time has come for us to really follow Christ, don't you? It's scary, but it's awesome. It's exhilarating. And I think God has called the church to do just that. Last question. How many churches are there in Danville? How many? A lot. Exactly a lot or? (laughs) Over a hundred. There's one. And we all serve together. We might have differences, but there's one. There's one. And never forget that the most important person in the ministry of Jesus was whoever was in front of him at the moment. For you, for me, when we think worldview, it's more than just, this is great philosophical and cultural stuff. It, it's down where we live and walk with our Savior every, every single day. Well, folks, thanks again for tuning in. Your time and attention were so very much appreciated, and we pray that this service was a blessing to you. This live stream will soon be available on our social media platforms, including our Facebook page at The Tabernacle Family and our YouTube channel, The Tabernacle Today. The sermon from this service will also soon be posted on your podcast platforms at The Tabernacle Today, as well as on our website, www.thetabernaclefamily.org and our mobile app. If you're searching for a church home, we would love for you to join our church family. Also, I want you to know that God has a purpose and plan for your life. And if we can help you grow in any way, feel free to contact us by visiting us in person, calling our church office, sending us an email or text, or by visiting our social media platforms where you can find plenty of online resources. We want to help you grow in any and every way possible. God bless you this week, and we hope to see you soon. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. God bless you.